Good afternoon and welcome to the St. Croix River Association's Water Resource uh, Committee's uh, Water Forum. Uh, my name is Don Hansen and we are privileged this morning and this afternoon to have Byron Carnes, a biologist uh, from the National Park Service. Byron has uh, been with the National Park Service for the past 10 years and there's been things that are bugging him and uh, he's going to talk about what that is over the last 10 years what has been bugging byron so without further ado i'd like to introduce byron carnes from the national park service thank you very much don well um i want to also welcome anyone who is online right now um you have the uh distinct advantage of not seeing my my uh my need for an air cut. Um, I definitely need one, so the folks in the room will have to suffer with that. But I am in uniform today, um, and uh, hopefully I can uh, make the National Park Service proud. Um, as you probably all know, I'm sure here in the room and out online, the National Park Service is celebrating its 100th anniversary in 2016. And so we're, uh, we're looking forward to many of the uh, centennial events that are gonna occur uh, both here at the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway and at National Park Service units throughout the country. So today um, I was asked to uh, give a talk on some work that um, I've been involved with um, in essence for uh, a dozen years or more. Um, it started out uh, as part of a master's project uh, back in the early 2000s and uh, it was updated again here in 2013-2014. And uh, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight both uh, the 2003 work and the 2013-14 work um, here today. If I can figure it, there we go. Um, so what I'll do today, uh, pretty simply, is to uh, give you some of the background of the 2003 uh, study and the motivation for for conducting this work back then as well as the current needs for the, uh, the current Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District and why I was approached by them to uh, continue this work. I'll of course go over uh, methods and then uh, supply you with some results and some of the uh, product that we put together and uh, some recommendations for the future. So, um, there's been a number of planning documents and a lot of assessment that's been done over the last 15 years or so. Um, the original document you see down in the uh, lower right, uh, the Lower St. Croix Spring Creek Stewardship Plan, which was put together by a private contractor, the uh, watershed districts at the time, and the uh, township of New Scandia um, in 2003. Um, and it's been updated and added to uh, ever since. The document in the center, the uh, watershed management plan from the uh, from the watershed district, the Carnelian Marine St. Croix Watershed District, was approved in 2010. It was updated and approved um, with some additions uh, just recently. And uh, and then the work that I was involved with in 2014 uh, updates some of the work of the 2003 plan. So as a matter of introduction, um, in 2003, as I mentioned, these local units of government and the private organization, a, a consulting firm, EOR, put together a comprehensive study of uh, over 20 streams and watersheds in Washington County. And uh, what was looked at was very comprehensive. There's a lot of folks involved. It involved uh, watershed size, the geology, hydrology, land cover, topography, uh, as well as plant communities, um, water chemistry and physical, physical attributes of the water, and uh, the stream biota. And this was to evaluate, evaluate the current conditions um, at the time. And, and so 10 years later, the watershed district came to me and said, hey, you, you did this 10 years ago. Would you be interested in, uh, in following up on some of the elements of this original 2003 plan, specifically the stream macroinvertebrates and the physical and chemical characteristics of the streams. 
So why did the district, why was the district interested in this information? Well, they have programs, um, many programs within the district, and one of them includes these individual stream and management plans. Um, they, uh, they kind of reflect the, the general health of the streams within the district, and they also show these tipping points. So if something uh, starts to go wrong in any one of these streams, there are, uh, there are points at which you, uh, you pull the tr trigger on um, additional management. The district provides basic levels of service um, called a routine watershed management, and that's for streams that are considered uh, within acceptable limits. If a stream is deemed to be impaired or focused, um, in more intensive management is then proposed. And this is uh, part of an overall strategy, and the strategy includes monitoring and assessment, which includes macroinvertebrate sampling and water chemistry. To continue with some of the background, um, in, in 2003, uh, motivation for conducting the research then, um, was to provide for 20 to 25 streams or spring runs, and those were identified. Um, they ranged from the uh, city of still the northern boundary of the city of Stillwater, all the way up to the Washington Chisago County line. Um, these streams and watershed, the, I'm sorry, the, the watersheds ranged from eight to five thousand acres in size. Um, they're mostly groundwater fed streams, although there are some surface water dependent ones. Uh, they flow through almost untouched uh, watersheds, um, as well as f flowing through uh, downtowns like the city of Marine. What they all have in common is they terminate at the St. Croix River. Um, hopefully these are represent representative water courses within the larger watershed, and this is hoped to provide uh, information for future monitoring and uh, because of that it's important that these streams are and remain accessible and uh, they're all spread throughout the eastern boundary of the watershed district. So using this 2003 uh, EOR study as a founda uh, foundation document the watershed district applied principles that I've just discussed, along with comprehensive baseline data that was uh, acquired um, for uh, each of these smaller watersheds to create assessments found in their 2010 management plan. However, ongoing condition assessments um, that are an obvious need um, are therefore part of the district's overall watershed plan protocol, and so it's important that they maintain this uh, schedule of monitoring and assessments. Um, this is all part of a stream status, and uh, as part of that, again, elements of that include um, microinvertebrate, macroinvertebrate, excuse me, and water chemistry data uh, analysis. There are two very important components of this, and it's also thought that if there is impacts from um, uh, human activity or whatnot, that these are two elements that are going to change as there is uh, impact to the watersheds of the streams. And this is all part of a water quality rating system. So my involvement began uh, back in the early 2000s um, when I was a graduate student at the University of Minnesota. And as part of my capstone project, um, I got involved because my um, advisor was involved in this project. And uh, we set about to, um, to look at a biological index um, that was based on local conditions and also to learn whether uh, we could sample during one uh, seasonal event and whether that would produce data that was relevant enough, um, valuable enough, um, to, uh, to provide some use to, to the document. Um, in addition, this, this document was put together uh, to assess the groundwater in northwestern, I'm sorry, northeastern Washington County. So there was a desire to know what c conditions the groundwater uh, were in. And uh, the, the typical thing that you do with, with groundwater assessments is um, do well sampling. And that provides you a, a point in time, a discrete location, um, but the, the beauty of using these terminal springs is you would get a composite uh, of all the water that was flowing from the county, groundwater flowing from the county into the St. Croix River. And also by using um, 
these relatively long-lived aquatic macroinvertebrates, some of which are, are highly sensitive, you get an idea of, of the water quality coming bubbling out of the water and heading down to the, to the St. Croix River. You can also do between two or among uh, various stream comparisons, and that can provide you with some additional uh, data. And so this study really reached out much uh, more broadly, uh, much more into the county than just the, uh, the watersheds of the streams that we're talking about today. So everybody wants to know where are these streams, and unfortunately, except unless you're online, I think here in the uh, in the audience, it might be a little tough to see these. But the city of Osceola is towards the north of the uh, of the screen here. Stillwater is to the south of the screen. Um, there are 19 different locations, different streams that um, I've identified here. There's one little gap. I'm sorry, it's up here. One little gap. Uh, just to the east of uh, the city of Scandia. That's where Zavril's stream, which was some, uh, a stream that was used back in 2003, there's since been uh, mining activities on the property, and because of that, the watershed district is um, treating this separately and monitoring this much more intensely. Um, and so that data was not available for me to use for, uh, for this comparison, so I've dropped uh, that stream out. So there's 19 streams in all, um, roughly a, an upper, middle, and lower group of streams that we use more for naming purposes than anything else. But they're, they're representational, I got that word right now, um, representational of, uh, of the streams and water courses that you find in this part of the St. Croix River in this part of the county. So the methods that I used to, uh, to acquire the data this time around, well, I followed the, uh, the protocols from the 2003 work. Um, we sampled in July of 2013 and in January of 2014 during the height of meteorological seasons, just like we had done in 2003. Um, I'd go to a particular stream, uh, remembering that I had been there 10 years before. Unfortunately, I'm not so old that I couldn't remember most of the places that I'd been to already. So I'd, I'd pick out the place where we had been, generally speaking, uh, made sure that the pool that I looked at was the first pool above uh, any inf high water influence from the St. Croix River. I would determine a, an upstream riffle run from that pool and a downstream riffle run from that pool. Um, and then I would set up shop and I would first take a, uh, a, a brown Nalgene one liter bottle and triple rinse it and uh, uh, collect a water sample that would be taken to the St. Croix Watershed Research Station for lab analysis uh, of such things as total suspended solids, total phosphorus, total nitrogen, including nitrates and ammonium. Um, and then I would take some in-stream readings um, with uh, my handy dandy little gadgets to determine flow, pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, total dissolved solids, and conductivity. And when I was done with that, I would take my D-frame kick net, my best friend, and go downstream and kick for one minute, a uh, uh, one half meter square area to, um, to kick up the macroinvertebrates. And then I would go upstream to the upper riffle run area and do the same thing. Uh, these were keep, kept in discrete bottles um, and, and uh, pro preserved with 70% uh, ethanol and rose bengal solution, which is a dye of organics. It makes the little critters pink and it makes it much easier for my aged eyes to identify um, when I'm picking. Um, and then finally, I took an air temperature, GPS coordinates, and pictures of the site. So that's how that was done in the field. I then took these samples back to my lab, quote unquote, which is the dining room table. And uh, we started picking the, uh, the samples for um, uh, up to two hours. And if it took that long at an hour and 50 minutes, you would start looking for any large or unusual insects um, before you would finish at two hours. And I should say that it was my daughter that did most of this work and she was, she got to be very good at this at the end. Um, these, uh, these pick samples were then sorted, identified generally to genus, counted, labeled, and uh, with the ultimate idea of providing these as a teaching collection to the watershed district. All data was entered into Excel and provided, and, the, and that data was provided along with the specimens and the report to the watershed district. 
So what did we find out? Well, first of all, we found 17,000, over 17,000 macroinvertebrates during the course of, uh, of this study. They were all picked, as we said, collected, picked, sorted, identified, and labeled um, from the two sampling events. The average uh, number of taxa per, per stream was a little bit less than 20. Um, and most streams were right around that uh, 20 number of taxa with the exception of three. Silver Creek um, was, uh, um, had quite a stream richness at 28 taxa, whereas, and, and Silver Creek I should mention is just north of the city of Stillwater. Uh, Swedish Flag is just north of the city of Marine on St. Croix and they had um, 15 taxa there. Uh, Highway 95, which again is down uh, close to Stillwater, um, had uh, 12 taxa. Um, we also identified sensitive taxa, which is a very common thing when you're doing uh, this kind of work. Uh, you look at mayfly, the, the percentage of mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies in your sampling. And uh, you also uh, will identify the dominant taxa. And this can all be then worked into your data. Um, the spoiler alert here is that um, this information seemed to be fairly close to what we found in 2003 for almost all the streams. We also then used um, an index of biological integrity, which I'm going to explain a little bit more of in a minute. Um, and of that, of the 19 sites that um, we looked at uh, and compared from 2003 to 2014, 16 of these sites um, had very little movement either up or down. Uh, in fact, five of the sites had a slightly higher or better uh, index rating um, in 2014 than they had previously. Um, there were a couple of streams, campsite number two, which is on National Park Service um, property, pretty close to Randy's house, actually, um, and uh, that one had slightly lower uh, uh, assessments uh, along with Willow Brook, which is found uh, um, within Croyside, which is a residential area. The, those two streams were um, identified as being slightly more impacted this time around. Um, the one concerning uh, bit of information was this Judd Street stream, which is in the city of Marine, um, which went from a, an excellent um, index rating to a fair index rating. Um, generally, the, the trends uh, throughout the whole um, sampling area uh, was influenced by the increase in the number of scuds, um, a little um, arthrop anthropod that is... Um, uh, found uh, very classically in these cold water streams. Um, more of those and fewer of the less tolerant minnow mayflies, the baited, min, baited mayflies um, that we found uh, fewer of this time around. So what is this uh, index of biological integrity or biotic integrity. Um, it's a very important component to the study both in 2003 and my current study now and it's a widely used um, uh, ranking system uh, that's used on freshwater systems containing mic microinvertebrates, macroinvertebrates, excuse me. Um, it's a classic system. Uh, uh, one of the more common used is the Hilsenhoff 19 87 uh, version that judges the tolerances of organisms to pollution and disturbance. What it means uh, essentially is the lower the number, the more uh, sensitive the organism is to, uh, to pollution and habitat degradation. Um, it provides a way to compare and contrast biological data. It does have a couple of downsides. A lot of these indexes um, use families at the family level of taxa, and oftentimes a species or a genus that is uh, more or less sensitive can really drive the, the scoring when you're looking at the whole family. Um, and the species tolerance, this is something that always bothered me when I was doing this work in 2003 and something that I wanted to, uh, to get more of a handle on. Um, the, the tolerance levels for these organisms um, are based by reading several pieces in the literature, but they can also, they can be um, driven very much by where the research has been done. So in other words, if uh, you find a particular organism that's, that's got a, uh, a tolerance ranking of a six in Ohio, it might be a four in Idaho, it might be a two in Georgia, it might be a seven or a or a three in Wisconsin. And that might be uh, somewhat useful if you are in Wisconsin, it may not be very useful if you're finding these insects 
uh, down in Arizona. So um, the, the, the point of this is that uh, regionally developed indexes or tolerance uh, levels need to be developed across the country. Um, but because this was what was used back in 2003, I used it again in 2014 for my analysis. Um, no stream, I should point this out, no stream, um, I hope you can read that, uh, no stream was found to be, uh, to have an index score higher than 5.8, which is just into the fairly poor category, and that was just the one stream. Um, most were uh, good to excellent, that's 15 of the 19 streams were good to excellent. Um, with three of them being uh, considered fair. Um, and as mentioned, only three streams changed more than one of the categories that you see um, shown here in this table. So as far as the chemistry that we discovered um, when doing our sampling, uh, first of all, the total suspended solids, um, always very tricky with these small cold water streams. Um, there were uh, only there were five streams that were found to be higher than the 10 milligrams per liter threshold for trout streams uh, that's considered in Minnesota. Uh, none was higher than 30 milligrams per liter. Um, but in talking with some of my PCA friends about these guidelines, um, they indicate that uh, this is a 90% compliance threshold, which means that 10% of the time you could still exceed that uh, that. Uh, level of um, suspended solids and um, still meet the guidelines for a trout stream in Minnesota. So it, it points to the fact that going out and just um, sampling one time during the middle of the summertime, it informs some information, but it's a good idea to have these uh, uh, samplings done on a more regular basis. Um, back in 2003, total phosphorus was negatively correlated with species rich, richness. And so we, uh, we analyzed for this as well, and uh, we found one stream in particular that was very troubling, and that was Judd Street, that had a very high level of uh, total phosphorus um, at the sampling period in July of 2013. Um, there were only three other streams that were even just above the drinking water reservoir standards for, for total phosphorus. So that indicates that most of these streams are well below um, the point of needing to, to really worry about them for uh, total phosphorus. There were four streams that had uh, higher than um, what would be considered average for the for, for nitrogen. Uh, nitrates were what drove that, and um, and yet all those sites were not um, all that much higher. Um, so that's just giving you an idea quickly of the of the table, and um, this table is found uh, in the 2014 report. Um, of the physical characteristics um, or attributes that um, I measured, such as pH, conductivity, uh, total dissolved solids, and dissolved oxygen, these were all within the acceptable limits for cold water streams. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there were three heavily surface water influenced streams, uh, Marine Landing, which is in Marine St. On St. Croix, uh, Judd Street, which again is in Marine, and then Highway 95, which is down by Stillwater. Um, these three streams experienced extremely low flows during the summer sampling. In fact, I think that at Highway 95, I couldn't even um, figure out what the flows were. It was, it was just a trickle. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's something of some concern. That's obviously going to um, uh, reduce the, uh, uh, the availability of habitat for your mic macroinvertebrates. Um, Judd Street Marine Gilbertson's, which is uh, Log House Landing in Scandia, and Mill Stream uh, showed some fairly pronounced swings in, in temperature uh, from summer to winter, which can be a little bit concerning. Um, and Judd Street in particular, uh, the summer thresholds were um, very, very high beyond what a trout stream would hold. And uh, I had to crack through a lot of ice in order to take any sampling in the wintertime. So it's, um, it's very apparent that that is surface water dominated. So, um, what does this all mean? Well, as uh, monitoring plans are developed um, and, and used for these streams, uh, it's important to use the, the baseline data that um, was acquired back in 2003, 2002, um, use the data that was uh, updated in 2013 and 14, and to begin to look at uh, um, fine tuning the IBI, this index, um, for, uh, for local use. 
Um, and I, th I still think it's important to understand the tolerances of these organisms that's well outside the scope of this project. Um, but I think that that's an important tool to be used down the line. I think it shows that winter only sampling can be uh, useful for, uh, for this kind of work. Um, but it also points to, this is again outside the scope of, of the work that we were doing here, but I'd like to go back and do some more analysis of some of the data to see if we can tease out um, some more, uh, essentially the upshot is that most of these streams did not appear, except for maybe an exception here or there, did not appear to be uh, impacted greatly over the, the course of the 10, 12 years. So that was that's the take home message, that the streams are still in pretty good shape. And they haven't changed much from where they were 10 or 12 years ago. That's simply put. But there's a lot more nuances to this and, and the data that we have here will allow us to kind of tease out some of that stuff if, if, if that's something that people are interested in or folks are interested in. Um, and what, uh, what I suggested for the future is because of, of what was found this time around, probably looking at um, uh, two, three, four streams for a um, uh, regular uh, sampling every two or three years, maybe add some streams uh, intermittently into that schedule, and then redo the whole study again in 2024, if it's possible, would be the way I would go to um, to monitor monitor over time and something else to point out um, when talking about this index um, this is some uh, midge non-biting uh, midge uh, or coronamid data that was put together by my advisor back in 2003 and it shows that this is all one family of organisms but there's many different um, uh, tribes or subfamilies that can be much more abundant than others. Some are very intolerant to pollution. Some are, are extremely tolerant of pollution. And so knowing the, uh, the subtleties of a group of organisms can be very important when it comes to using them as these valuable tools in assessing water quality. So this was a slide that I specifically made unreadable to the folks here in the room because I wanted to make just a quick uh, point that uh, I think that if, if, if organizations have limited time or resources, but they still want to monitor and assess their, their water systems using a one-time wintertime uh, sampling event um, and, and trying to determine representative represent, I don't know why I can't say that word, streams that will be uh, uh, very good markers for the, um, the entire watershed district for this example here, um, I think is very important. It's not feasible to go out and, and re-survey uh, 19, 20, 30 streams every, every year or two or three or four, but you can go back if you know which streams are most likely to be impacted. And as a point of example, Gilbertson's Creek is, runs right next to a proposed change in a landing. They're thinking about upgrading a landing and, and doing some significant work to it. Well, that would be a stream that you that fortunately we have some background data on. That's, that's the great thing. We have two times now some, some good data um, related to that. But if there was something that was going to be done in the future, you need to have a reference point in, a, in order to know what was impacted. So... Um, <clears throat> The, the streams in, highlighted in yellow are the ones that I would suggest uh, for regular study. And, and that's pretty much what I have to say. I have um, some examples here of stream sheets. This is from the 2010 um, district's watershed management plans for each one of these streams. And uh, the, the vast majority of the, of the data taken um, uh, for for this particular sheet was from that 2003 EOR report. And so I kind of wanted to make sure that everything looked fairly similar. So these are the, the sheets that, um, that I put together for each one of the individual streams. Um, I should also mention that the initial 2003 study, which I have a copy of up here if anybody wants to take a look at it, was um, also designed to be a citizen's monitoring guide that never really happened, but part of the beauty of each one of these stream assessment sheets is that you'd have something to pass out to you know, local residents or whatever to try to get them all jazzed up to go out and continue to do some of this monitoring work on their own. So um, I have some of the sheets uh, here. If there's any particular um, 
stream that I've got that you're interested in doing some further discussion. But um, I think that unless I can think of anything else, um, I'll just provide some acknowledgments. And it's I think it's it's uh, a good homage to always put your um, your advisor up on the screen. And I'd like to thank these people. And um, <clears throat> if anybody has any questions or whatnot, the uh, the 2014 plan that I worked on is available from the Watershed District. It's online. And that is the, uh, the information above. So <clears throat> I will be more than happy to take any questions at this point. Yes, sir. You mentioned quite a bit about the Judd Street. I did. And the difference between the 2003 and 2014, it sounds like it went downhill. Yes. That time. Do you have theories about what's going on? Well, um, uh, one of the things that was done during the 2003 um, data analysis is comparison of streams. And they were discovered that three of the streams were highly influenced by surface water. So Judd Street is one of those surface water dominated streams. And so things that happen, there's a wetland right behind it, and anything that would happen there could, could influence this. Um, it could have been just the luck of when I did the sampling, I suppose. But um, my suspicions is that something has occurred in the city that has changed um, hydrologically or whatever, um, and uh, that's that's influenced. Where is Jet Street? It's um, it's south of town. If you if you're from the Brookside and you're going south on that, it's it's really close to where the Eagle's Nest is, <laughs> which everybody seems to know in Marine. Follow up question on that: mm -hmm. How did the Watershed District use your well, they've put it on online here, um, so I should probably be repeating these questions. So there was a question about Judd Street and and what I thought would might have been the causes of some of the problems, and I think it's a surface water dominated stream, so that that could play a lot into it. And how is the watershed district using this information? Um, again, uh, one of the motivators for doing the the follow up survey study. Uh, work in 2013 was this anticipation of um, adding on to or updating their 2010 plan, if I'm making any sense whatsoever. Um, so he wanted to have the, the administrator and the, and the district managers were interested in having this information in order to use that as part of the updates for their, for their plan, for their guiding document, their watershed management plan doc document. So I'm hoping that's what they, <laughs> that's, that's what they're, they're using it for. Mm -hmm. So Highway 95 is right in the ravine, if you're coming around the corner, right before you get to the boom sites, um, the you know the uh, the wayside rest and and all that kind of stuff. And and I should point out, and and I didn't really have the time here to go into all of these streams individually as much as I love them, and I could wax poetic for a long time about each one of the streams and the, the good things and bad things about each one of them. But that's in that's in the report for the most part. But this 95 ravine back in 2003 was a um, an outflow for Big Carnelian, I think. Um, so when there was, and, and that was a, that's a lake that I believe is, or at least at the time could be, um, that was impounded to a point where they could raise or lower the level. So I'm getting some head nods indicating that that's true. So there were times where we would go out and sample and it was almost like a movie where you'd, it would just be a trickle coming over. There, there's a nice little waterfall that's right by the highway and all of a sudden the water would just rush over this and you'd have to scamper to get out of the way, um, get to see flooding uh, in, um, or a dam break. Um, uh, so that was pretty interesting stuff. But that kind of flashiness d does not bode well for an insect living in the, in this system. So, um, and, and now that they're not using it as an outflow anymore, there isn't much in the way of groundwater input, I guess. And so that's why the flows, especially during the summertime, are so, so, um, so little. So. Any other questions? Just in general, the, sure. the macroinvertebrate sampling uh, was kind of a push by, I think, <coughs> was it DNR or PCA back at that time? I, they had volunteers doing it. I was doing it on Sunrise. Mm -hmm. I was curious how that was ever used. Macroinvertebrate sampling yeah. in general? Well, it's part of the protocols, especially for the PCA. And, and I think the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency is doing a marvelous job 
They've identified um, a protocol now for assessing the health of something like 80 plus watersheds in the state of Minnesota. And this is all part of their monitoring. And they've, they're working through every watershed to gather baseline information. And then their plan is to go back every 10 years and, and reassess this stuff. So, so the work, the beauty of getting work like that done is it gives you something to compare 10 years later. So it's, it's, it's really a valuable, I think a very valuable tool. And like I said, the nice thing about these insects is some of them will live in the water for a year, sometimes longer than that. And, and, and so they have to deal with the, the, the things that are coming at them over that time period. And unlike just dipping down and getting uh, a sample on a particular day, you're essentially getting a sample that lasted a whole year um, while the organisms are in the water. So any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Byron. That concludes our water resource forum for today. Please uh, refer to our uh, St. Croix River Association website for upcoming speakers and uh, upcoming uh, water resource forums. Thank you. Offline, not offline. Oh, don't swear yet. <laughs>